Hello students! Uh, welcome to another video in our reverse engineering lecture series, Dynamic Reverse Engineering. What is Dynamic Reverse Engineering? Well, Dynamic Reverse Engineering is uh, the process of reverse engineering a program using dynamic tools. Dynamic tools as opposed to static tools are tools that analyze a program at runtime. If you're interested in static tools, check out the static reversing video of this module. All right, simplest dynamic tracing tools, um, L-trace and S-trace. L-trace traces library calls, S-trace traces system calls. You have um, undoubtedly used um, S-trace in debugging your shell code for uh, the shell coding and the sandboxing modules uh, and figuring out what the sandbox does for the sandboxing modules. Um, both S-trace and L-trace are reversing tools as well as debugging tools and, and, and um, understanding tools. Uh, one very easy, simple example, you can um, L-trace a program with providing it one input, all A's. L-trace a program providing it another input, all B's. Save both traces and diff them and see what the differences are. From that, you can infer some idea about the behavior of the program at a very high level. Uh, this will be enough to solve some of the um, challenges uh, for this module, and it's a useful tool in general. Uh, don't forget the basics, such as L-trace and S-trace. Um, of course, once you have to dig in in a dynamic setting, um, you have to reach for more powerful tools, such as GDB. I'm sure that you've already used the GDB quite a lot in your um, uh, efforts on the course so far, but let's take a look at a feature you might not have used, which is GDB scripting, right? If you have a complex program, you're not gonna be working with a complex program, you're working with this little tiny um, cat clone I wrote, uh, an assembly that basically just reads and writes in a loop as long as read returns a success code, otherwise it exits. So let's um, compile it, static, uh, um, no std lib um, and cat.elf cat.s awesome all right let's take a look gdb cat.elf um, a couple of things when gdb launches up it'll actually execute everything found in your um, home directory slash dot gdb init file here, I have a very simple one. I highly recommend yours to include the um, uh, enabling of a GDB debugging environment, such as Jeff, Pwn Debug, um, or um, PETA, or something along these lines. If you are uh, um, unclear about this, look more in our... Uh, Fundamentals series and the Linux process execution where I talk about debugging. All right. Um, so I have a simple GDB in it. The most important thing is this, uh, setting the proper disassembly flavor and enabling history. Being able to hit up and redoing what you did previously is a big help. So now I can say, all right, let's uh, break at the entry point. Here we are or in, at, at, at main. Um, now what? Now I can um, uh, disassemble main. Let's display four instructions. I can step forward. All right, here's the syscall, right? So I can step past it. All right, now let's say I want to break at the syscall or I want to break at right after this is called to see what I, I um, uh, wrote. I'll, I'll do that for the next one. Next time around. Now I broke here, right? I can see, okay, what what did I write? Okay, it is, or what did I read in? At this ASDF, ASDF, awesome. So far, this is nothing new to you. It's just stepping around in GDB. Of course, I can automate this. GDB has a scripting language that you can write arbitrary GDB commands and they will be executed. And the awesome thing is you can set these commands 
to run on um, uh, breakpoints. And you can actually do some pretty uh, advanced things. I highly recommend, I'll show you the basics, basically this. I highly recommend you dig in uh, through Google how to make conditionals, uh, if statements to do you know this and that based on, on um, conditions and so forth. All right, but here, um, what I'm gonna do is break at the instruction right after that read syscall, and I'm gonna print out the stack and continue. And this is super useful, so check it out, here we go. Uh, I will launch that with dash x, um, cat.gdb, all right, breakpoint one has been set, I'll run, I'll put in some input, and here it is, breakpoint one triggers, this is my display, of course, uh, disp every time gdb stops for any reason, it'll execute all of the commands that you have for the display commands, so here it's my x, 5i, uh, RIP, um, here's where I am, uh, the, what's in front of me. And then here is my print um, X slash S of RSP. Here's what got read in. All right, here's another one. Okay, all right, awesome. Now I hit Control D here and it exits normally because I close standard input. Pretty cool stuff. Right, um, you can do arbitrary things here. You can do um, use printf to create uh, complex uh, uh, print statements that you can then grep for in a different script that calls this script. Let's say if you were trying to automatically solve something, you say uh, read syscall read in d bytes and uh, rax. This is a complete experiment. Let's see if this works. No, invalid argument syntax. I think comma rx. Oh, read syscall read in five bytes. And what if about one byte read, read syscall read in three bytes? Oh yeah, aa and a new line. And <laughs> it looks like I don't clear the old ones off of the stack, this makes sense. Um, pretty cool stuff. Right, um, basically uh, you can script GDB to do things for you. Arbitrarily complex things, uh, including changing memory and so forth. If you, if you just haven't figured out one part of the program but you really wanna understand a different one, you, you can clobber that part by changing its memory um, and et cetera, right? Super powerful um, uh, tool in your toolbox. Now, you notice when I compiled this, I did dash static. What if I do dash static by default is position dependent. Everything is at this OX 40 blah, blah, blah. What if I do static position independent? Now I have a problem because if I do this, I created this breakpoint. Oops, yeah. What if I start? Okay, see, I tried to start it. I created this breakpoint, I set it. When I start it, it says, oh crap, can't access breakpoint here because if I do info proc map, we are, we're, we're, oh yeah, yeah, we are at some random location in memory. Okay. Um, how do we fix this? Well, well, we can uh, do this by properly dealing with position and pen executables, right? We can understand where GDB will map the page. This should have updated. Uh, hold on, technical issues. What is going on? Ah, there we go. All right. Sorry about that. We can. Um, uh, GDB will try to always load position dependent executables at a fixed address. Depending on your version of GDB, this fixed address can vary. It can be uh, all fives and then a four, zero, 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 or it can be 
uh, some crazy 7FFFF. On my machine, it's 7FFFF, so I have a local variable in my GDB init that sets the base to this, so that then, instead of break at whatever, OX4, blah, 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 I can just break at base plus the offset that I want to break at. So let me show you what I mean. All right, uh, what's going on? All right, so I do my compilation, static pi. Uh, let me show you the disassembly of this. Okay. Um, much better. All right, I wanna break at 1023, hexadecimal 1023, right before the syscall, or let's say 20, 1025, right after the syscall. If you recall, we used to break at 401025 when this was position dependent. Now, it's whatever the base address is, plus uh, 1025. Uh, but this is super easy. I do the same GDB, in, uh, let me uh, edit my script. Instead of this, I just do base plus OX 1025, and it is, all perfect. The same GDB sets the breakpoint. Now let's see if this will work. Wait, 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 wait. Why is it setting at all fives? Yeah, on my version of, of GDB, it, it maps it in here. Uh, my GDB in it must be, yeah. I screwed up the GB in it. Okay, no problem. Just look it up on your system what it is. Usually, like I said, it should be one of those two uh, values and you can update it. Now, it'll work perfectly. So I set the breakpoint, start, it all works. I continue, enter something and here we go. SDF new line, that's four bytes read by the syscall and this is cat catting it back out to me. Very cool, so that is GDB working with static, uh, with position independent code. Very cool. All right, uh, let's move on. Final topic of this video, timeless debugging. So imagine if GDB was so cool you didn't even have to set breakpoints. Well, it is. GDB and a number of other tools have record replay functionality. They can record the entire execution trace and then add on demand, replay it for you. Or you can rewind execution and then replay. It's super cool. Um, what, uh, with some, some uh, quirks that you have to be careful about. Uh, GDB's record replay is um, fairly uh, straightforward and let's say naively implemented in, in some sense, uh, makes it, making it not very performant. Uh, there's a much more performant um, tool, RR, for record replay um, that is, you know, designed to be so good that it can work on like um, complex programs like Firefox. Uh, unfortunately, it relies on hardware features not available inside the Pwn College environment. Um, so, you, if you want to use RR, you have to uh, install it on your own machine, and that machine has to be fairly new. Probably by now, um, it's not too insane that you'd have a machine that supports the hardware features RR uses. Um, another one is Kira. It's a pretty neat tool um, written for hacking, for, for, for reverse engineering. Here's the website, uh, kira.me. Um, you have to set it up and it's a bit of a complex process, but there is a Docker container that you can use to make it easier on yourself. Uh, we don't have this set up, but you can. Um, I will show you. GDB and reverse engineering uh, and and reverse execution. So let me <coughs> um, GDB this file again. Uh, let's recompile it statically so I don't have to deal with the base address. All right. So GDB cat.elf. All right. Here we go. I'm in main. Awesome. Now what? I can type record and it'll start recording and then I can run. Uh, sorry, I can continue. And you know, I do my, my typing, all right, kill. All right, so it says the next instruction is gonna exit. 
That's no good. Do you want to stop the program? Yes. It's saying this because it has a recording. If the program exits, the recording will go away. But this way, the recording is there. I can do all sorts of introspection to the recording. You can look up GDB record replay for the full or, or click on the link in the slides for the full documentation. But the key thing to know is just like there is step instruction, next instruction and continue, there are reverse versions of it. So I can do, let me put here the next five instructions. So I'm about to execute the syscall and afterwards there's all uh, null bytes, all garbage. If I hit step instruction, the program exits, but I can hit reverse step instruction and I'm moving backwards. Now I'm moving backwards through the write and read uh, syscall setups in main. And I can do RC. So I, then I can do, sorry, step instruction to go back forward, reverse step instruction to go back backwards, reverse continue to go all the way to the beginning, and then start stepping forward again. And this is all pre-recorded. I'm just rewinding and fast and, and fast forwarding through the recorded trace. Um, I can, so if I want to stop right before this syscall and see what the value of RAX was, I can with one caveat. For some reason it's five. You can see that's bullshit, uh, it's not accurate because if we step backwards until we see move RX zero, the value of RX should have been zero here, but GDB thinks it's five. GDB does, I think, some optimizations and doesn't actually save the state at every instruction. Five is actually what that syscall returned. If, if we um, step to the syscall, right before the syscall, and look at uh, stuff on the stack, there's nothing on the stack. The syscall reads, I typed ASDF enter, the syscall read five bytes, that RAX uh, is the return value of the syscall, right? The problem is it was also for some reason recorded in the trace as the value of RDX back here after set RDX, uh, RAX, sorry, after set RAX, a move RAX zero. So it's a little quirky. Keep it that in mind. One thing you can do is go back, rewind to the place you want to start execution at. So let's say we want to start execution at the second read syscall. Again, REX is five because I typed ASDF enter again. Here we can do record off, uh, sorry, record stop. And the recording stops. And I have my uh, live program again, but just rewound to an earlier place. So now I can start executing again. I would recommend hitting record again. It doesn't cost you much, just some performance overhead, but now you can rewind at any point and try again. So I can go step instruction. Hold on, let's go back to the beginning. Record stop. All right, if I do step instruction, step instruction. Okay, I guess there's something weird with restarting the recording in the same session. But if I stop the recording and I then I step forward into the system call, you can see it does the system call again. It doesn't just replay recording. You can do is blah, blah, blah. And uh, here is what showed up in RSP and so forth. The program is alive and we're running again. Pretty exciting stuff. This really helps if you are really trying to figure out some intricacies about data flow or something you can do reverse debugging gdb you can run path to a certain point <coughs> decide actually i need to back up i missed something you back up you look through it it's very very nice in kira but like i said kira takes a little bit to get running um all right that is the uh reverse engineering dynamic tool um kit that we'll talk about today uh, all of this you'll use in your challenge problems. Good luck.